listening to the Carleton Political Science Podcast, brought to you by the Department of Political Science at Carleton University in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. I'm Asif Ami, one of the PhD students with the program. So we have in Canada a big federal election going on, and I figured this would be a good time to talk about that election. And we have many Canadians in the department here at Carleton, one of which Kind enough to take some time to talk to us, Paul Thomas, who's a senior research analyst at Samara Canada, and also uh, an adjunct research professor here at Carleton as well. How's it going, Paul? It's going great. Thanks so much, so much for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. So, yeah, I just figure with the election just a few days away, we've we've passed the advanced polls. We're, it's the final straightaway, really. This would be a good time to talk about it and kind of get some information out to people. Um, you're an expert when it comes to democracy, particularly elections in Canada. How have you been taking all this in? So, I mean, it's been a great reminder that campaigns matter. Um, so a lot of people in the summer were like, oh, what's what's the point? Uh, the polls show the Liberals and Conservatives, you know, fairly close, but the Liberals seem to have an edge. And now things have changed quite dramatically. You see the NDP surging unexpectedly uh, and the Bloc Québécois uh, rising from the political ashes to be <laughs> a force again. Um, and the Liberals, um, through unexpected developments, um, falling away. And what's, uh, in some ways, I kind of am taking heart is that the campaigns matter. What has been depressing about this campaign is how much, though, um, policy hasn't mattered as much as the attacks on individuals or re- revelations about their past. Uh, ironically, the Liberals started this to a significant extent before the campaign, digging up things about Andrew Scheer and his uh, social conservative views or, or past social conservative views, uh, and then wound up being the targets uh, of it themselves when um, revelations about Mr. Trudeau's uh, wearing a brown and black face came out. And those sorts of discussions, even questions about um, Jagmeet Singh, it, it's much more about the likability of him as a person necessarily than the likability of the NDP as a party or the policies it would put forward. And so it's been a bit disheartening in that regard that the question of how the country will be governed seems to be a bit lost in this popularity contest uh, between the leaders. Yeah, leadership is always important with a campaign, but you really brought up a key point that it's, it's not even about leadership. It's about personality variables in a way. What do you think the impact has been on people, on citizens, on voters? I think there has been uh, a lot of engagement, more than might have been foreseen going in. Uh, There was a bit of a a sense of disenchantment that a lot of people found. Um, As compared to, say, 2015, when there was uh, a quite mobilized effort to bring, say, youth or what have you into the campaign. Um, This time around, though, it has been interesting to see, uh, despite some initial fears that this would be, um, uh, see perhaps a a decline in voter turnout, that the advanced polls saw a 29% spike in uh, attendance. Mm -hmm. The debates getting high rating numbers, so quite a lot of people tuning in to see. uh, The last French language debate shattered the previous um, viewing record. And so there does seem to be engagement and interest. That said, it does come back to this question of whether voters are feeling that they can actually support their true preferences or if they if it becomes this game of strategic voting of who is who is the least bad candidate for me. There's been a number of efforts to have strategic voting websites come up, uh, which always raises various questions about how realistic they are in their projections. And we also have seen, Uh, Unfortunately, some uh, fake news and other elements coming up. So there was a particular story about Justin Trudeau alleging that he had uh, committed various sexual offenses when he was a teacher that have been demonstrated false, but that were circulating widely. So it has been, in some ways, an encouraging environment um, for engagement by citizens, but also a challenging one where people are facing both tough choices between candidates and also uh, a challenge at times to navigate through the misinformation to get to uh, something that they can hold on to for making their their voting choice. Yeah, the Globe story thing was a fascinating one because I have friends there, and I have friends in media, and I was with a friend who's very close to many people, the Globe, last week, 
And she was telling me that she actually heard it from people in the globe that they're sitting on this story. And that's how deep spread of fake news became that like it even permeated the organization. It's interesting. I mean, my main source has been um, following Justin Ling in Canada land and that mm. sort of he sort of made a cottage industry out of going after the uh, the Buffalo Chronicle on which is one of the main, I guess, drivers of this story. Yeah. Uh, but it was interesting to see, especially when you have um, social media as a primary tool for people getting their news, and especially the the evolution of, say, your Google news feed, where a story just pops up. And oftentimes the headline is the main thing. The source is almost less relevant because it just puts in information based on whatever algorithm. And so a number of people did see these stories just popping up in their news feed like anything else. And being able to filter through that is a challenge because many people might hit sort of the outrage first and then <laughs> look later into the details. But despite all this misinformation, issues still matter to people. And really the core issues of the election from my bench, when at least have been changing constantly with climate change now being uh, the primary one for most people who are still focusing on something as important as policy. For you, what have been the key issues throughout the campaign and how have they changed? I think you're certainly right. Climate change has been a big one. And you've had a number of international events driving that. So the UN uh, Climate Convention was going on. Greta Thunberg came for that. And then she came up to Montreal for um, I, one of the climate strike rallies. You've had various uh, climate protest events, um, shutting down bridges in different cities. And so that has certainly helped to raise the profile in addition to what the parties are campaigning on. In, in many ways, it's, it's helpful to see that with the ex possible exception of one party, there is a, a general consensus that climate change is serious and action needs to be taken. Where it's been more challenging is when the policies put forward are put to tests of feasibility, that things become a bit more challenging. And there's a lot of debate back and forth about which party would actually lead to which target and whether the targets themselves are actually valid. And this has been an interesting one to see, say, the parliamentary budget officer as uh, an organization that tries to bring some independent actual costings to the party platforms mm -hmm. being brought in as well, where you see, uh, say, for example, the NDP platform making bold statements on climate change, but perhaps uh, fiscally challenging ones where, you know, a projected $40 billion deficit, uh, the Green Party as well having some financial considerations. And so you do see this tension between climate change on one hand and, you know, the, the fiscal implications down the road. I mean, beyond that, however, there hasn't been, I don't think, sort of one particular issue that's galvanized people beyond this question of affordability. Uh, and so you do see a lot, and the, the entire conservative uh, platform in large part seems to be about make, giving money to people to help them feel that they have uh, a more affordable life. So, you know, do you have kids? Here's a tax credit for you. Do you have a house? This is how we're going to uh, make things easier. But that it it's a bit more, uh, it's like a, a cloud. It's hard to grab onto one part because there's so many things that go into whether life is or is not affordable. I think it's great, though, that you mentioned the parties because this election really seems that we're in a transition point with the parties. And, you know, Cardi's known for having that theory of the multiple party system here in Canada. Do you think this kind of marks kind of a divergent point from the party system of old? Are we seeing the emergence of a new party system with the rise of new parties like the PPC and the surge of the Greens? Well, I mean, it in some ways it's... Um almost a reverse of the 1990s. So in the 1990s, you had very much a split on the right wing of the political spectrum. The progressive conservatives and the reform party sort of split the right wing vote and helped the liberals stay in power. The NDP was quite weak at the time, uh, lost the official party status for a period in the 1990s. Um, and the Bloc Québécois sort of took Quebec off the map. Uh, then things changed. The different branches of conservatism reunified into the Conservative Party of Canada. Um, but then you had the NDP suddenly surging, uh, at first taking over space from the Bloc Québécois and then also getting some footholds in other places that might traditionally have been liberal. Uh, and now, and also the Green Party poised a bit to make even further gains, especially on the West Coast. And so you, you have this somewhat almost mirror image where the Bloc Québécois is still there, but now the left is the part that's splintered. And so people who may 
uh, at one point or another have just been solid liberal voters are now wondering which left stream party is the one for them. And part of it also has been that the liberals, at least in their campaign rhetoric, um, some would debate whether it's been matched with reality, but they really cloaked themselves in this mantle of being the progressive party and stealing a lot of the language uh, that the NDP had traditionally put forward as, you know, the party of progressive social values. So we'll have to to see to what extent it uh, takes hold. But the main element is that if 2015 was one of the first times in a while that we had a truly national election where the same parties had a competitive basis in every province um, and the Liberals won seats in every province across the country, we may see a return in this election to a bit more of the regionalized system that we had uh, back from the 1990s where different parties have their basis of strength and there isn't one party that really is pulling from all parts of the country. Oh, does this feel like the end of brokerage? That's a good question. <laughs> um, some, some would argue that brokerage died a while ago. Um, I think the Liberals did try to revive that model to an extent in 2015 um, and were aided in large part by the fact that the Conservatives had been in power for you know a, a decade and that weighs on any party. The NDP had also, I guess, struggled to capture voters' imaginations after Jack Layden. Uh, and so they did present a, uh, the image of a party that had something for everyone. They had some, you know, they would only run modest deficits and then return to fiscal balance. Great. They were going to legalize marijuana. Cool. Um, they were going to uh, pursue action on climate change. Okay. And so they were able to sort of um, bring everyone into that one big tent. Uh, reality has turned out a little bit differently on some of those promises, especially a lot of people on the left feel a bit betrayed, say, by the pipeline purchase and by the failure on electoral reform. Mm. And so that has made that brokerage a bit more challenging. People are much more skeptical now than what uh, was the case in 2015. And so the question remains is whether there's enough uh, centrist spirit or enough fear of the conservatives, depending on one's point of view, um, in order to keep voters in the liberal tent, or if they're going to stay truer to maybe their first preference and vote for something further left. Well, it's interesting because throughout the campaign, we've seen this dead heat between the conservatives and liberals you know, maintain. Obviously, who's been ahead versus who's second place is the one thing that hasn't maintained in that dead heat. But the dead heat is there. What's your takeaway from the different polls and the polling data that we've been seeing with who's in the lead versus who's not in the lead? I mean, it's been really interesting to see how... The Liberals have been resilient. If you would ask people right when, uh, well, even going back to August, you had the Ethics Commissioner report uh, saying that Trudeau had uh, broken various rules in pressuring Jody Wilson-Raybould over SNC-Lavalin. Uh, then you had the revelations coming out about his uh, wearing blackface, brown face previously. That's a, a fair bit of baggage for a party to take on. Uh, in the midst of it, in the midst of a campaign, or immediately prior, in the case of the ethics commissioner report, and so it's been surprising how resilient their support has been. That is starting to waver a bit more now, as the people have gotten to know a bit more about um, Jagmeet Singh and the, the NDP as a potential alternative. And you also have seen the Green Party support beginning to decline a bit. For the Conservatives, though, it, it is quite fascinating as to whether they are in a position of having almost a maximum potential um, vote share of around 33 to 35%, whether there's either concerns about the party's positions or concerns about Andrew Scheer as leader that are preventing them from capitalizing on the liberal weakness. If anything, the liberal weakness seems to be seeing people migrate further to the left, not coming as back to the right with the conservatives. You mentioned earlier the advanced polls. Uh, about There has to mean 5 million people turned up for it. I took my mom on, on Thanksgiving to go to the polls and felt great about it, and she was pretty happy too. I think she was happy that we were hanging out. It wasn't just like eating turkey and then leaving. Um, do you think this sort of surge in turnout is advantaging any particular party over the other? That's a really good question. So if you think about it from the point of view of 
parties having a, what they call the ground game. So parties during the campaign try to identify voters who are going to support them and then make sure those supporters get to the polls. So when advanced polling was less of a less available, um, it was only one day, maybe two days, narrow hours. It meant that a lot of the party's effort was focused on election day. It was a very frantic operation to literally knock on people's doors and say, hey, gotta go, do you need a ride to the polls? Having the advanced poll spread that out means that you're, you have more opportunities to do your, your get out the vote effort. Um, and so that really will advantage parties who have strong on the ground uh, organization. So say for example, the NDP might be a bit weaker in number of ridings, um, may not, they had trouble getting candidates nominated, um, and appeared to have less of a of a ground game, so to speak, a constituency level organization. And so the rise of the advanced polls may well benefit those who have greater constituency organization than the liberals and the conservatives, just because they might be able to translate support amongst the population into actual votes, whereas those who are not maybe as equipped might see some of the the apparent support in the polls fall away when it actually comes to getting out at the ballot box. And I guess lastly, in terms of question, what do you predict the outcome is going to be? Are we going to see a minority government? Are we going to see coalition building happening in the wake of it all? To be honest, I mean, I would be surprised if there wasn't further shifts. Um, Although, as you say, with a lot of people casting advanced ballots, I guess that means a lot of people have already made up their minds. So um, anything, any movement we do see now, there is a bit of a discount rate, you know, knowing that some votes are locked in. But I do think there will be more of a, of a, of a movement towards um, the, the two parties <laughs> as, as things come down, that some people who might be considering um, voting for one of the other parties may move back to the center as they start thinking over the longer term. Um, but then again, uh, it does seem fairly certain right now. I mean, if, if you were to take the polls today and put it forward, it looks like a minority situation. The big question will be how the parties react to that, and especially whether you see a situation if the conservatives take um, more seats and a larger vote share, but still are short of a majority, uh, should the Liberals choose to try to form a government or to remain in government, I guess is the better way to put it. The Conservatives will likely, um, based on 2008 and other situations, argue that it's an illegitimate tactic. Thankfully, we have recent examples uh, from British Columbia where the current government is is formed by the second place party with support of the third place party, keeping the first place party out of power. And so this this is a very legitimate thing in our parliamentary system, but there's going to be a lot of um, spin and noise uh, one way or the other if we come out into that scenario and if the liberals try to remain in power. Yeah, it makes me think back to Stefan Dion and uh, Jack Layton signing the agreement, which went nowhere. Yeah, and it's interesting that um, they did go... I mean, that that image of the agreement is something that we have seen now in BC, for example. There is a written agreement between the Greens there and the uh, New Democrats. The big question would be whether the parties would want a formal coalition, which is where cabinet seats are shared. So it's it's actually a, a two parties coming together in one government, or what's currently um, happening in British Columbia, which is called a confidence and supply arrangement, where... There's only one government, only one party in government, but another party agrees to support uh, the governing party on uh, confidence votes, on budget votes, so they can get their agenda through. And this is something right now in the UK, they also have that arrangement. It allows the sort of smaller party, the one that's propping up the government, to maintain a bit more of a distance uh, and also to throw more blame. So that if something goes wrong, uh, they have the more of an option to pull the plug and say, look, our, you know, our deal's over because you haven't honored this particular element. Whereas if it's a coalition government, it just is a lot uh, messier as to who is responsible for what.
And I guess one last question, pitch one more question. What have you been working on lately? What's What's been going on with your research and the work you're doing with Samara? Um, so right now, throughout the campaign, we're running, I guess, three projects, which has been uh, an adventure. So one is looking at um, the candidates and trying to do uh, more in-depth profiles of them than might normally be found. So getting into the question of what kind of volunteer background do they have? What kind of political background do they have? Uh, were they you know, local councillors um, at their city or town? Have they been volunteering in a particular type of organization? And also getting into their profession and their education background. And so the main goal out of all of it is to see how well the candidates that we have reflect Canadians um, demographically, but also what are the pathways to politics? So is it something where people... A lot of people get their start in municipal politics and then move up. Or does it vary by party? So do you have some people coming out of more of a social movement background or out of advocacy? Uh, Another thing that we're doing right now is surveying the candidates as well to try to get their views on party discipline. And so this is, uh, we're sort of billing it as what kind of MP will you be? And asking whether they think MP should be free to vote independently on some matters before Parliament, whether MP should have the right to launch a review of the party leader, uh, whether MPs should have protections for matters of personal conscience, which we're likely to see again when questions of assisted dying come back before Parliament um, following recent court rulings. There has been some surveys of sitting MPs, but we're, we're hoping to see if there's to what extent there's variation across candidates as well. Um, And then the last thing is looking at social media use by candidates, tracing how they engage on Twitter uh, and whether it's something that they use to actually engage with voters and highlight local issues, or if it's just more of a way of redistributing central content. So hitting retweet on whatever a party leader puts out, Um, or even having you know, sort of locally customized variations of a central party package. And the question there being whether social media is actually living up to its promise of offering engagement and discussion, or is just another broadcast medium for centralized control of messages. Okay, all very relevant stuff. I'm looking forward to reading it all. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, but thank you for joining us and helping us out with this podcast. Again, the election's just a few days away, and it's going to be a pretty exciting time, so it's great to get some expert opinion on it. Thank you. All right, so everyone, thank you for listening. You can follow us on SoundCloud in the coming weeks, also on Spotify and iTunes. Till next time, take care.